is that true what you said today about um, you know your anxiety levels being at a seven in terms of presenting? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. You know, look, look at the the hands. Can you see? You can show them to the camera. They're kind of hot and sweaty. So for sure, you know, it, I mean, it, it varies throughout the day. But, you know, like if I get asked a really hard question, anxiety goes up. You know, if I come up with a really good answer, it kind of drops. People laugh at my jokes. It, drops if they don't laugh it goes up you know and what, if they, what if those symptoms become uh, problematic in that you know you've got a, a dry mouth mm. or uh, you're shaking so much that you can't actually mm. get it out have you experienced that and is there a, a mindfulness technique uh, you know obviously you allow for the anxiety but if you're if it's manifesting mm. physically mm. it can physically stop you well firstly uh, I wouldn't be calling these things symptoms because as soon as you refer to a feeling or a thought as a symptom, you're labeling it as something bad, toxic, pathological or unnatural. Anxiety is normal, completely normal emotion that, that everybody feels. Um, you've probably come across the, uh, the well-known public speaker, Alan Pease. I was talking on stage with him a couple of years back and I said to him, Alan, you know, you've been talking on stage for 40 years. Do you still feel anxiety? He said, uh, yeah, I've still... He said, I, I've still got the butterflies in the stomach, but now I've trained them to fly in formation. And, uh, you know, that's kind of what it is. Yeah, anxiety, we've evolved anxiety for a purpose. Um, when you're in a challenging situation with an uncertain outcome, anxiety is kind of the feeling that you're, you've got more adrenaline, faster reflexes, you're kind of prepared to deal with that challenging situation. So it's not a symptom. And what turns it into this extreme state where you can't speak and you're all choked up is actually struggling with the anxiety. If you kind of struggle with it, oh no, here's anxiety, I mustn't feel anxious, this is really bad, then you get anxiety about your anxiety. Oh, no, it's getting bigger, more anxiety, more anxiety. And it's that struggle with it that actually turns it into a, a disability. But if you drop the struggle with it, you go, oh, okay, here's anxiety, it doesn't ever get to that point. It just becomes, like if you talk to any stop, top stage performer, they'll they all have learned that the benefits of anxiety you channel it into your performance you know this yourself right uh, but they're not likely to use the term anxiety they're likely to talk about being revved amped buzzed and adrenaline rush and then once in a blue moon a stage performer says oh no this anxiety is really horrible it's really terrible i can't go out on stage and now it's turned into stage fright it's not the anxiety it's the attitude towards it yeah. And it's the framing of it and then fusing with that energy and telling yourself essentially that this is stage fright or I've got writer's block, I, I can't perform. All of that kind of stuff, you know, I can't do it, it's bad and this feeling is really bad and I need to kind of get rid of this, you know, like uh, one of the most common things I hear is uh, I need more confidence and what people mean is I need to get rid of these feelings of anxiety and I need to get rid of these thoughts about failure. Um, but those are normal thoughts and feelings that you're going to have when you step out of your comfort zone into a challenging situation. You know. And I think it's a, a wise man once said that it's the actions of confidence that come first <laughs> before the feelings of confidence. Who was that wise man? <laughs> <laughs> I think that might have been you. <laughs> yeah, the actions of confidence come first, the feelings of confidence come later. After you've taken action over and over and over again, initially, the actions of confidence come and they come with feelings of anxiety. I like in one of your books, I think it's the, the confidence gap, you um, do an exercise where you ask us to raise our left arm while saying, I, I can't lift my left arm, I can't mm -hmm. lift my left arm, I can't lift my left arm, all the while lifting it. Yeah, yeah. And essentially, that's the essence of a lot of this philosophy, isn't it? That yeah. um, we will always have the negative feelings, we'll always have the anxiety, we'll learn to, I guess, uh, create a better relationship with it, but it's taking the action that we need to live a meaningful life regardless. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a good way of saying it. It's about changing our relationship with these thoughts and feelings. A, a lot of pop psychology approaches, let's try to get rid of these thoughts and feelings. It just doesn't work in the long term. You might be able to push those negative thoughts out of your head or those uncomfortable feelings away in a short space of time. You're most likely to be able to do that when, when you're in a nice, safe environment in the middle of that motivational seminar or while you're listening to that CD in your car or reading that book, you can do it. But when you're in the real situation, all of those feelings are going to be there and all of those thoughts are going to be there. So how can we change our relationships? I, I can have these feelings, but I'm not pushed around by them or overwhelmed by them. I can have this voice in my head saying doom and gloom stuff, but it's like a radio playing in the background. It's not controlling me. I can take control of my actions, kind of do what's important. Mindfulness essentially is um, present moment awareness. 
it's that's a part of it. I, I, I best I think the best definition is mindfulness is paying attention with openness, curiosity, and flexibility. So it's an attention process. It's paying attention in a particular way. There's an attitude of openness. I may not like or want what is happening here and now, but I'm open to it. More than openness, I'm curious about it, even if it's unpleasant. I'm curious what I can learn from this, how I can grow from this, what's happening. I'm, there's a kind of almost childlike curiosity or a scientific curiosity about this. And there's flexibility in this attention at times. Right now, my attention wants to be on you. We're having a conversation. But if I kind of, you know, suddenly hear a car accident outside the window, I want to shift my attention and be able to deal with that. There's times I want a very narrow, focused attention. If I'm a brain surgeon, I want to be focused on a tiny bit of the brain for a long period of time. But if I'm going for a walk in the countryside, I want a, you know, a really broad awareness, you know, of all, everything that I can see and hear and touch and taste and smell. So it's this flexible, open, curious attention. Uh, you know, you'll often hear in definitions of mindfulness the present moment, but actually that's a given. The only thing you can pay attention to is what is here right now. You can't pay attention to the past or the future. You can only pay attention to thoughts about the past or the future that are here in the present. How can we use the, the concept of psychological flexibility or, or mindfulness in a, in a working situation okay. to essentially to A, uh, develop resilience mm -hmm. with the, the daily challenges and B, to develop better relationships with the people we work with and for? Okay, those are big questions. <laughs> Psychological flexibility is a model for resilience. And, it, and in fact, if you look at the research on resilience, you'll find the elements of psychological flexibility in there. Um, basically, the more adverse or challenging the circumstances, the more unpleasant emotions we're going to have, fear, anxiety, frustration, anger, and so forth, and the more negative thoughts we're going to have in our heads, that will show up. Difficult, challenging circumstances trigger that stuff. Um, and what happens is you tend to get all caught up in it. You get all caught up in these thoughts and feelings about what's going, and when you're all caught up in this stuff, you can't see clearly. You, you, um, and what mindfulness enables us to do is kind of separate from those difficult thoughts and feelings. I can see clearly there's more information coming in. It doesn't get rid of them. It kind of creates space for them so that I can engage in the here and now and take control of my actions. I, you know, I kind of say to people, imagine going around like this all day. How difficult would it be to act effectively? How much are you missing out on? There's huge gaps in your information. Now, as we start to separate or detach, uh, from these thoughts and feelings, suddenly my view of the room is my, I can see more. And when I'm really separated from them, uh, I'm free to act. Notice if my hands are here, they haven't disappeared, they're still here. If there's something useful I can do with them, I can do it, and if not, I just let them sit here. And this is what we learn to do with our thoughts and feelings. So that's relevant to any challenging or difficult situation. That's a fundamental part of resilience. Can't stop this stuff showing up, but you can change the way you handle it. And of course that implies uh, the implications of that for resonant relationships. All relationships are challenging, pretty much. Now, even dogs, like dogs are easier to live with than humans. Dogs push your buttons. Uh, maybe goldfish, you know, but anyway, you know, you can't. so as soon as I, I've got a relationship with a complex human being, sooner or later, there's going to be stuff that pushes my buttons, there's going to be difficult thoughts and feelings. Uh, my mind's going to create judgments about you and opinions of you. And if I fuse with that stuff, if I get all caught up in it, I start to get so fused and caught up in my judgments about you that I lose touch with you. And kind of what mindfulness enables me to do is kind of separate and detach. Okay, well, here's all these judgments and thoughts and feelings, but I'm going to engage with you and see you as you are in this kind of curious, open, non judgmental manner. And that's fundamental. And clearly, I'm fabulous. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but, but essentially, we, de we detach uh, from the struggle that we're having with our thoughts by diffusing those thoughts. And you've got a lot of uh, quite kooky techniques mm -hmm. for diffusing the, the craziness. Um, and we either diffuse or we expand mm -hmm. and we allow ourselves, which is actually new information to me because mm -hmm. I was of the ilk of positive thinking and try and stay as, mm -hmm. as upbeat and good as you possibly can for people. But what you're saying essentially is that Happiness and sadness, the, the light and the dark, all come from the same pipeline essentially. Mm. And if we squeeze one off, we squeeze the other. Absolutely. You know, kind of, 
Uh, <laughs> I like that. Happiness and sadness, they're, they're drawn from the same pipeline. Yeah, for sure. You know, they're, they're both linked to the human capacity to care. It's fundamental to caring. We are caring beings. And it's that caring that enables us to have the satisfaction and joy of getting our needs met. It's also that caring that means that we have the fear and frustration when our needs don't get met or when something that's precious is, is being threatened. The only way to stop the unpleasant feelings is to cut off your capacity to care. If you didn't care, life would become pointless and meaningless and empty. So, you know, we need to redefine the notion of happiness as living a rich, full and meaningful life in which we feel the full range of human emotions, the pleasant and the painful. You know, love and pain go together. And it would be a pretty crappy life uh, if we didn't have that duality, those polarities of, yeah. of uh, you know, feelings. Absolutely. You wouldn't know one without the other. And, you know, the, the positive thinking stuff is... Uh, I'm not against positive thinking. What I'm against is the hype about positive thinking, like it's the answer to everything. Very often, um, there are all sorts of situations where positive thinking would be really detrimental. If you've got a big black mole growing on your arm, you don't want to think positively about that. You want to think, oh, no, I better get that checked out at a doctor. Not, oh, it's fine, it's just a sunspot. Uh, and trying to think positively about uh, stuff that is really hard and difficult will often stop you from dealing with it effectively. Yeah, I mean, to give you an extreme example, if somebody you love is dead or dying, and you start trying to think positively about that, you're, you're going to lose touch with, uh, with reality. You want to recognize this is really painful and it really hurts. And, the, and if I didn't care so much about this person, I wouldn't be feeling this sadness. You know? Self-compassion and compassion for others is, is a big part of this. Uh, Self-esteem is, is a funny term because there's different meanings. Um, and one of the most common ideas of self-esteem is that it's, uh, it's kind of having a, a high opinion of yourself, prizing yourself and, and positive self-talk, building yourself up and fusing with this positive self-talk. I'm a great person, I'm a winner, I'm a champion. And the danger with that is that firstly, the more fused you get with that kind of positive self-talk, there's lots of research on this, uh, the greater your risk of egotism, arrogance, narcissism, also, uh, people with very high self-esteem, there's a direct, co in that sense of the term, a very direct correlation to relationship difficulties. I become closed off to negative feedback. I don't want to hear about it because I'm so caught up in my image of myself. I'm wonderful. I don't want to hear about this. Um, whereas self-acceptance is having a realistic appraisal of yourself, recognizing your strengths and recognizing your weaknesses. Every human being has strengths and weaknesses, are honest, uh, acceptance of that and um, self-compassion goes a step further it's self-acceptance plus also being really kind to myself I will screw up I will get things wrong kind of be kind and caring towards myself so uh, kind of both really uh, are far more empowering, empowering than self-esteem it's not even just I will screw up I will fail I have to that's part of the human experience it's, it's the only way we grow yeah it's inevitable everything that you can do well today involves failure repeatedly. So uh, just quickly let's talk about values and goals mm -hmm. and the demon boat. Mm -hmm. I love the demon boat. So goals essentially are the what, mm -hmm. it's what we're moving towards. Mm -hmm. Values are the why, why we're... we're you they're know. the why and they're the how. The kind of the goals, uh, you know, they're, they're the how we do what we do. The goals are what we want to do, the actions are what we're doing, the values are the, the how we go about doing it and the why we go about doing it. So, you know, good example, marriage versus being loving. Marriage is a goal. I can tick that off the list. Tick, 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 marriage number five, tick, done. But if my value is to be loving, to be caring, to be supportive, to be honest, I can never tick that off the list. That's there the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day. Notice I can live the values of being loving and caring and supportive even if I never achieve the goal of marriage. I can live those values, even if I never have a girlfriend or boyfriend, I can live those values towards friends, neighbours, my pot plants I can be loving and caring towards myself. Why is it that we really don't have a clear understanding of personal values? We tend to, in a corporate sense, you know, you walk into those businesses and there's a, a list of values mm -hmm. on the wall. When you ask the average person, you know, what are five of your key values? Mm -hmm. 
I, I think most people would struggle to answer that question. Mm -hmm. why, why is it not something that uh, is prevalent in our society because it's so integral to being a mm -hmm. good person or to being a, a full, a uh, holistic person? Mm, well caught there. <laughs> <laughs> holistic person. Yeah, it's kind of... Um, you know, that's a great question. We're a goals-focused society. Uh, most people don't really understand what values are. You, most people, when I start talking about values, they come up with things like ethics and morals and codes of conducts and shoulds of rules of right and wrong and all this kind of thing. So it, it's quite alien to our, our society. And, and, you know, it's kind of ridiculous. You go into these workplaces and you see this list of values and someone's kind of tried to impose these values on the workers. Well, you can't impose your values on others. Your values... Values are my heart's deepest desires for how I want to behave as a human being. And you might say these are the company's values, but if they don't fit with my values, hey, guess what? It's not going to be a very good match here. Um, so, uh, you know, from a young age, our society focuses on goals at school. school get good grades so that you can go to uh, higher education so that you can get a good job so that you can get a good income so you can have a big house for your wife and two kids and have your summer holidays these are all goals they're not values like you know the values might be around curiosity or learning <laughs> i don't know a lot of schools that place major emphasis on the values what are your values uh, my big four values, uh, I would say uh, connection, caring, uh, curiosity and contribution. These are kind of really the big four values that are fundamental to relationships with anyone or anything. Connection, can I be present, engaged right here, right now? This goes for any relationship with friends, family, with my body, with the environment, with my dog, with my sport, with my hobby. Can I be connected, engaged with it? Caring. What do I care about? Expressing that, uh, you know, caring might be expressing concern, it might be expressing affection. Caring, if I want to build a relationship, I've got to care about whatever it is or whoever it is I'm building that relationship with. Um, curiosity, being curious about this relationship and where it's going and how I'm learning. You know, uh, curiosity fundamental to getting better at doing whatever I want to do. And, and contribution, am I giving something? Am I giving something to this relation? Even, even if I talk like mindfulness is about a relationship with your own thoughts and feelings, what do I contribute to the relationship with my thoughts and feelings? Do I contribute space as an expansion? Do I contribute peace instead of fighting with them? Can I contribute some peaceful space to this? You know? And what are your struggles? So, you know, you, I look at somebody like you who obviously has dedicated, you know, a large pro portion of his life mm. to this work. And no doubt your, your brain, your reptilian brain still goes back to its default setting of mm. panic and fear. And mm. is it a time frame thing as you become more disciplined <laughs> does it mean that you know instead of a week of suffering you can get it down to um, uh, 10 minutes <laughs> i doubt it i mean yeah I, I mean you know mindfulness skills psychological flexibility skills like any skills the more you practice the better you get so you know here's the thing like uh, for 15 years i've been trying to have a totally mindful shower totally engaged in the shower and kind of savoring every sensation and i've never managed it um but 15 years ago, I would, like, I didn't even know I was having a shower. I was so caught up in my thoughts about what I was going to do later. Whereas now, I'm mindful for about 95% of the shower. I still kind of get hooked and pulled into my thoughts, but most of the time I can pull myself out pretty quickly. So, yeah, I suffer with all sorts. Like, I showed you my sweaty hands. You know, at the end of my workshop, I'm shaking hands with everybody, and there's some embarrassment about that. There's some struggle with that, you know. It's, it's... You know, <laughs> I mean, um, you know, like at, at, at the, the workshop yesterday, um, I was trying to get people in touch with how judgmental your mind is. And I asked the question, you know, what does your mind say when you catch sight of yourself naked in the mirror? You know, <laughs> does it go, <gasps> you know, well, my mind's not too flattering. You know, it's kind of, uh, I mean, so struggle shows up in many different ways. Well, let's talk about those um, those little voices, mm -hmm. uh, those demons. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you walk me through that analogy? Because I, I just love the idea of you being a captain of a ship out mm -hmm. to sea. And, and this is really talking about specific goals, that when you make a decision in your life that you're mm -hmm. going to make a change or mm -hmm. there's something that you want, mm -hmm. um, we have to be prepared mm -hmm. that that's going to be challenged. Okay, so it's like 
you're the captain of a ship. You're the only person on the ship. And you're steering that ship out at sea. And there are all these demons that live beneath the deck of the ship. Really scary demons. They're painful memories of the past. They're fears of the future. They're all these painful emotions, kind of um, unpleasant sensations. And they've made a deal with you that as long as you keep the ship drifting aimlessly out at sea, they'll stay beneath the deck of the boat so you don't have to see them. Well, this is fine for a while. But after a while drifting out at sea, you start to see all these other boats heading towards the shore. And it's like, that's where I really want to go. You remember, you've got maps here. There were places you wanted to go. There were things you want to do. So after a while, you put your hands on the tiller and you start turning the ship and you head towards the shore. But the instant the ship changes direction, the very instant, the big demons come running up from beneath the deck and they gather around, they go, we're gonna kill you, we're gonna rip you, we're gonna tear you to shreds. And so you go, whoa, whoa, sorry demons, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, I'll turn back, I'll turn back. And you turn the boat back out to sea and the demons disappear. And it's like, oh, phew, relief. And for a while, there's relief. But then you start to see all those other boats heading towards the shore. And you remember that's where you want to be going. So you put your hands on the tiller, you turn the boat. And again, the instant the boat starts heading in the right direction, the demons are back. We're going to tear you to shreds. We're going to kill you. We're going to pull your arms and legs off. And this has been happening your whole life. And what really changes is when you reach the point where you realize that these demons have got no power to physically harm you. Their thoughts and feelings and emotions and memories, their power lies in their ability to convince you that they will hurt you or harm you. But once you realize that's their only power, then they lose their power. So what you do is you keep your hands on the tiller, you keep heading towards the shore. The demons gather around, they threaten you, they threaten to tear you, and you just keep your hands on the tiller heading towards the shore. Then interesting things start to happen. Firstly, you start to see these demons in broad daylight. And you start to realize they're not as big as they seemed. You know, in horror films, you jump most at the stuff you can't see clearly, the stuff that's in the shadows. When you, they would never show you the monster in broad daylight in a horror film because it's not scary. It may be ugly, but it's not scary. So you look at these demons and you start to see they're smaller, they may be ugly, but they're nowhere near as big as you thought. And you start to get used to having them around and you realize that, you know, they can't hurt you, they can't harm you. And you start to realize there's much more on this ship than just demons. There's demons here, but you know, there's a whole big ship, there's a sky, there's clouds, there's seagulls, there's, uh, there's mermaids and dolphins, there's angels, there's all this other stuff here too. There's not just demons, there's a lot going on. And so you head towards the shore and you feel the breeze and you feel the water and you take it all in. And some of the demons will disappear. Some of them will give up trying. They've realized they've lost control of the boat. They'll disappear. They will be replaced by new demons. They'll be replaced by the demon that says you'll never make it to shore, or you wasted your life, it's too late, or when you get to shore, the cannibals will eat you. There'll be new ones, and you make room for those too, and you keep heading towards the shore. Or they can be sneaky too, can't they? They can say, oh, you don't need to go near the shore today. Yeah, You've worked really hard. You should relax, get back out to sea. Exactly, exactly. They're very, very clever, yeah. No one will ever know. It doesn't matter, you know. So we're helping people to have uh, an experience that they wouldn't ever get in their lifetime um, and with stand-up comedy essentially. So we're helping a, a bunch of people to become better communicators mm -hmm. and more confident communicators mm -hmm. by doing something that they wouldn't have believed possible. They mm. need to crush their own assumptions mm. about that process. And we've run the program before last year and 22 people got up on stage and 22 of them had a great experience. Mm. And then had to wake up the next day and say, goodness, I did something I didn't think I could. Mm. What else have I been telling myself? Mm. But those demons throughout the process get very, very loud. Mm. Um, what advice would you have? I mean, you're, you've done stand-up. Mm. You, you understand what it's like mm. to get out there and be vulnerable, to put yourself on the line. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you have any advice? <laughs> uh, quote the Nike slogan, just do it. <laughs> it's kind of, um, it is terrifying. And uh, it, it, it's, um, it, you know, I, I used to do stand-up comedy as a hobby. I've, I've appeared on live television doing it and so forth. And it's a big risk because 
from time, if you do enough comedy, sooner or later you're going to fall flat on your face. You're going to have an audience that doesn't laugh, and comedians call that dying on stage because that's what it feels like. It feels like dying, but you don't actually die. You just kind of make room for the pain and you carry on. So uh, my advice would be breathe into the anxiety, make lots of room for it, notice that voice in your head, it's going to tell you all sorts of things, tap into your values, why am I doing this, does this matter to me, is this important? If it's not important, don't bother with it, but if it is, then take hold of the microphone, slow your voice, talk, say what you have to say. And mindfulness would have to be a very important process in creativity because if you can quieten the mind and sort of declutter and, and come back to you know a place that you can concentrate or yeah. you, you must find more options available because you're expanding that peripheral vision. Yeah, I, I, uh, you know, you know one, one of the things that blocks creativity is you fuse with, oh, I've got no ideas or I've got to come up with ideas and you get so caught up in that it kind of kills your creativity. Whereas if you can... Uh, you know, take a, a step back from that. I use the analogy, let your mind play on like a radio playing on in the background. Don't try to change the radio. Don't try to turn it off. Don't try to ignore it. You try to ignore a radio, it gets louder. But just let it play on and just engage in what you're doing. And from that kind of engaged, mindful space, creativity often arises. So is there more money in the workshop business than in the comedy business? <laughs> a lot more. <laughs> for me. <laughs> Not for Billy Connolly, though. It's kind of, you know. <laughs> no. you, you have incredible output, just finally. You have, um, you know, you've, you've got a huge body of work. You look like you're 12 years old. Oh. Um, how is it that you are able to achieve such a vast... Um, such a vast amount of success. I mean, you've got a numerous amount of books. Mm -hmm. You run these wonderful workshops. What's the process of making a decision? I'm going to write a book. I'm going to get it done in this mm -hmm. time frame, and then you know, being able to see that through. Well, my wife would give you a different answer to me. <laughs> my wife would accuse me of having a love affair with the computer. Um, but in fact, you know, often writing is just hard yakka. It's just the forcing yourself to sit at the computer and keep writing even though you know even after I've written I'm writing my seventh book right now and my mind still says the same things each time no one's going to be interested in this you'll never get published blah 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 this is a waste of time this is crap but I just know that story so well now it's just like an old radio tune ah oh, there you are you know thanks mind oh it was crap is it okay cool you know carry on uh, and it doesn't dis derail me most of the time sometimes it still derails me but most of the time I just let it play on and then often I, uh, I'm writing and when I'm lucky I get into flow uh, but there's other times it's like digging a ditch and, and then I kind of get anxious and frustrated and then it's just commitment and I'll sit here and keep writing even though I feel uncomfortable, even though my mind's saying it's crap. And either it will be crap or it won't, but you know, one of my favorite quotes is from Ernest Hemingway, the first draft of anything is crap, you know, and, and I come back to that. I actually have that on a little card by my computer, oh, well, it's okay, <laughs> if it's okay for Ernest Hemingway, it's okay for me. Um, obviously, if you want to be productive in any field of human endeavor, and whether that's being productive in writing books or running your business or as a parent, or uh, you have to make time for that activity. Uh, so if you want to be the world's greatest dad, you're going to have to make time to be that dad and spend it. If you want to be the world's greatest, you know, tennis player, you've got to make time for tennis, which means you're going to have to say no to other things. Uh, and so this is the hard part. What do I say no to? Um, what do I uh, put aside? Yeah. And, and what, what is your discipline around that? Do you write for you know four hours a day, eight hours a day? Do you put it in blocks? Uh, for me, uh, I aim for a minimum of 10 hours a week, but uh, it, I'm very flexible. I'm not one of these people that has to write at a certain time. Sometimes I write morning, sometimes I write night time. But um, 10 hours would be the minimum, uh, often more than that. Uh, you know, um, so uh, yeah, I, I have to kind of schedule that time and often find myself saying no to things that I really want to do because, um, you know, I'd love to watch more movies, read more books, but there's only so much you can do, you know. Is there a correlation between mindfulness and success? It depends how you're defining success, okay? So the conventional cultural definition of success is achieving your goals but I encourage people to think of success as living your values your values are right here right now can be lived in this moment 
And mindfulness is fundamental to that form of success, knowing what my values are, putting them into play. Yeah. And mindfulness is power. It is, it's, it is. Mindfulness will also help you achieve your goals too. It's kind of, uh, you know, one of the things they say about successful people in the conventional notion, the, pe the person who's achieved a lot of goals, is that they're very focused. So it's kind of that focus. Yeah. Great, thank you so much. Thank you.